we're very, very excited today to have Jessica Regis, um, who is, as I mentioned, a math teacher at Amesbury High School. And with her is Graham McKay, who is from Lowell's Boat Shop. Uh, and these two have put together a truly amazing program um, where uh, they do get the kids outside, not only outside, but on the water, doing math, having fun, and we actually have a couple of students here today as well. We're so excited. So without further ado, I would like to turn the program <laughs> over to Jess, who's going to explain a little bit about the wonderful partnership that she has. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Also, thank you for welcoming two high school students. Um, this is Kaylee and Brianna, and they're going to jump in at various points today. So somebody over here was mentioning earlier um, you know, when are we ever going to use this sort of stuff? Well, that was the name of the original grant that got this happening. When will we ever use this? Uh, that's a question I get all the time as a math teacher because you can't re really can't come up with a reason for synthetic division that you're going to have in real life. I still don't have one. But for trig, I have plenty. So uh, when will we ever use this? Math on the Merrimack, trig on the water, and sextants in the sky. All the same stuff. We're using math at Lowell's Boat Shop. So I'm going to start with the money because we know that's the important part. So two years ago, uh, we received a $10,000 grant from the Amesbury Education Foundation Incorporated, EFI. Uh, they allowed this whole thing to get off the ground and start going. They have funded everything from these lovely boxes, which hold our equipment, to the equipment inside, a whole bunch of sextants, um, the journals that the kids write in and have all of their math in, and most importantly, getting us to the boat shop and back during our 87-minute class period so they don't miss any other class during the school day. So, What's the A form? Sorry, you said Amesbury. Oh, Amesbury Educational? Amesbury Educational Foundation. Foundation Incorporated. Foundation Incorporated. Incorporated, that's the I. <laughs> um, since those two years have passed and we ran out of money, Effie gave us a second grant and we also got <coughs> a matching grant from the Essex National Heritage Area and a grant from the National Park Service to keep this going. So that should get us going for at least another year. So, okay, the money is done. Or two. Here's what we do. On the very first day, we go three to five times. Um, and as I said, it's during the school day. The kids are not missing any other classes. We have long blocks, 87 minutes. Our school is about two miles up the road from Lowell's, so they come to class, check in, jump on the bus, drive down, and there we are. The first day is primarily just learning how to row. Most of these kids have never been in a dory, let alone on the Merrimack, God bless you. Um, you know, if they have, they've been in a motorboat or a jet ski or something like that, kayaks maybe. Um, very few have been in a dory, which Graham makes. They're real nice. Uh, but they have no clue, they don't know how to row. So that's day one because everything else falls from that. If they don't know how to row or to get to certain <laughs> destinations, bless you. <laughs> this may continue for a while. I <laughs> she must have a math allergy. Uh, <laughs> but if they don't know how to row or how to get to these different places, then everything that we're trying to do subsequently does not work. So day one is learning how to row. And as I said, most of them have not been there before. So the first day is always very interesting. Um, some of them are naturals. They get right into the boats and can handle it. Some of them are, you know, those people who are trying to get into the boat and they're shaking all the way down. That's hilarious. But they end up really confident at the end, so that's great. Uh, we use sextants, which is a fun word to say with high schoolers over and over again. That's right to take angle measurements to generate our own data to bring back to class. So this is instead of doing, you know, the angle of elevation from you to a point on a cliff. Nobody cares. But they take these angles of elevation. It's their information. It's their data and actually makes sense. So we learn how to use these. Uh, before we go to the shop, and this is something, as the program has developed, the very first time we went, they just you know, we used sextants on the first day at the shop. They had no idea what was going on, and it took a while. Since then, with feedback from the kids, they say, you know, we really should learn how to use the sextant beforehand. So we start in the classroom, 
just taking angle measurements like we would do something with this board right here just to see you know do you know how it works and then we'll go to a larger part of the school so maybe the cafeteria or the hallway so they get a sense of a longer distance gives you a smaller angle we'll go outside because you know we gotta go outside but it also gets them used to using the equipment outside where it's a more variable environment and we talk about the parts and everything else so Classes go three to five times, usually during a three-week span of time. The spring group goes in May, which is nice most of the time, but kind of chilly because it's on the water. The fall group, this year we went only in October. Um, we had one day of Indian summer, and the rest were kind of murky and gray and cold, but, you know, they had to row harder to stay warmer. Um... For me, and I don't know if you guys want to jump in on this part, but a huge process of this is trust. Um, if I can't trust these kids to go, to follow directions, to be safe, they don't go. But we try to get everybody to go at least once. For me, that's important, but even more important for me is to see these kids working together. I'm not in the dories with them. I'm not in those boats, unless I really need to be. Um, you know, they have their own little captains and they have their own, you know, boat groups and teams that work together. <coughs> but when we're out on the water, it can't, it's not that safe classroom environment of, I wasn't listening, what are we doing? They need to figure it out and they need to work together. And we have a very limited window to get everything done. So. Communication is really key, I found, especially with my boat, is that we had kids of leveling um, comfortability. So a lot of people weren't really comfortable in a boat. We had one of those like, leg shakers, and we had people who um, really found it kind of difficult. We were not one of the people that got it right away. <laughs> but with the communication, um, definitely key, and that's kind of what got us rowing eventually. Yeah. <laughs> they definitely did take a while, but they got there. So after they take a crash course, sometimes literally, in learning how to row, Kaylee gets that. Um, so as I said, we use sextants. We'll do it in various places. They'll do it along the shores. Different spots will stop. Sometimes it's right, as you can see right here. You know, open water, more or less. They hang onto a buoy and somebody stands up, and it becomes a lot more difficult because. It's definitely a change from taking a sextant measurement sitting on the ground versus, you know, being in the water and things are bobbing around and moving. So it's a challenge, which is why we started earlier back in school. Um, this is one of the favorite trips of most people is finding the depth of the water. So what happens is that we'll row to different places across the river. Graham has put out buoys ahead of time. And this is one of those things where everybody in the boat has a job. Somebody has to hang on to the buoy to make sure that they actually stay in the same place. While somebody is taking the depth measurement with a weighted measuring tape, you can see the weight right there, from different points, trying to make sure it goes down straight and doesn't get taken by the current, while someone else is taking a sextant measurement so they can figure out how far they are from the shop and somebody else is writing it all down. It's a busy trip. That's a very quick hour. But it's a lot of fun. They like that one. And then we map it afterwards. Um, they also use sextants and compasses, so we'll use them horizontally to take a horizontal angle measurement, which I don't think was the original intended use for sextants, but it works for us. Um, and then we mapped out the banks of the river, so the shoreline. And Bob in a boat. So I will intro this and then they can talk about it. So a classic math problem that most people have at least heard of is Bob is in a boat on a river with a current. And if Bob can row two times the speed of the current, how long does it take him to go 12 miles up and back? And by the time you reach the end of the word problem, people are cross-eyed and have no idea what we're talking about. So, and I can see from the um, you know, social studies group here, you still have no idea what I'm talking about, so that's okay. This is usually one of the last days of our trips. You know, we need to have their rowing to be its most optimal at that point to make sure they get where they're supposed to go. In essence, they start at a point, they take a section measurement, they row against the current and time it. Timing it is the important part, some people forget that. <laughs> so they row against the current, time it, write it down. Take a measurement to know how far they've gone. And then time it coming back with the current. What was very awesome this year in Kaylee's class when they did it, 
because um, sometimes we'll, you know, you'll have outliers in the data when we bring it back to class that they're like, oh, two miles an hour, 1.8 miles an hour, nine mile an hour current. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, in her class, and I think it actually comes up in a later slide, they were all within four tenths of a mile per hour. It was like 1.3 to 1.7 miles per hour current, which was great. But this is a great one because they actually figure out how fast the current is going and pushing them but also how fast they as a group can row, which is really, you know, it makes a difference. Nobody cares about Bob, but hey, we can row faster than them. That's awesome. So, I don't, Brianna had quite a day. Oh, All right, so for my group, we went later in the afternoon, so we lucked out in the four previous times we went, we didn't have a problem with current and wind, and we already had a hard enough time rowing, most of us. So we, we were able to manage fairly well until this day. Uh, we, had a, um, we had to deal with the current, we had a bit of wind, and so we had definitely a force that we were rowing against, which we were supposed to measure, which is supposed to be cool, that's mad. Um, and instead of going from point A, which is the buoy, to point B, the other buoy, we kind of went in the zigzag, trying to right ourselves, and so instead of like getting there and like, what was a good time? Like six minutes? Yeah. We got there in like 23, oh. my group. <laughs> yeah, um, that was my boat. So that's as good. And it was just interesting. Yeah, but what was great was that their, uh, their current calculation when we came back was actually pretty accurate because they were not that good rowing back with the current either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, it was okay. Did you want to say anything? Okay, Kaylee doesn't want to talk about it. Um, but that's a great trip, and that's kind of the one that makes it all connect and wrap up together. So we're not actually doing the math on the water. On the water, we are generating the information. We are calculating. We're not going to calculate. We're going to calculate it back in class. But we generate it. We collect it. We write it all down. We measure it. But then back in class, that's where the math actually comes in. So hard to see, and you know, Greek for most of you. But a lot of trig here, you know, algebra, systems of equations, just to figure out it's that personalized learning. So it's place-based, it's personalized, it's experiential, it's all those fun educational buzz buzzwords that we love. Um, the best part for me is that these are juniors and seniors. It's after MCAS. I don't really have to worry about it for most of them, so I do have that freedom. But it's all within the curriculum. You know, there's a strong focus on trigonometry. And the algebra, yeah, that's supposed to come from before. But algebra doesn't go away until you graduate and then you don't have to use it ever again. <laughs> um, but it's all right in there and it works exactly with what we're doing. You know, do we spend more time with this than some other things just like regular functions? Yeah, but it's worthwhile because it makes the learning theirs. So some of the stuff that we have done, um, this map right here was the shoreline. I think the boat shop is like right here in that picture. We held that up to a Google map of the river and it was extremely accurate, which was very awesome because that's a great thing to say too. When, you know, the kids do all this stuff. Okay, yeah, it's them. Yeah, it, it kind of makes more sense, but is it real? And to hold it up to an actual real life map that somebody has done and it lines up, that's very cool. Um, the depth predictions, so when they took the depth of the river, um, one class predicted all sorts of, <laughs> we have some very creative and imaginative people, what the bottom of that river looks like. Um, what we actually got, not to scale, but it's shallower on the Newburyport side, and then there's a big basin in front of the shop. And they got to see that, and seeing that, instead of me just telling them, oh yeah, no, it's deeper there, you know, they might care a little, so that's nice. So as I said, the information is personalized, it's about them. These are the, oh yeah, this is the Kaylee's class. Their rowing rates, which were pretty close. This must have been Lydia's group. <laughs> They're not as fast. Um, but their current rates, you know, 1.3 to 1.6 miles per hour. You know, statistically, margin of error, that's all really close. So that's very cool stuff. And um, we do it in class and it just, I think, it makes sense. Yeah, good. Um, and then just beyond the math, because you know, we can only take math so far, we're learning about teamwork, 
the local history, the local culture, the environment. You know, they're getting to know people like Graham and others within the community that they wouldn't otherwise necessarily see. So, it's pretty good. Good stuff. Um, this was a quote from this year. I forget whose journal it was. But I like this quote. Is it yours? I think it's Kaylee's. <laughs> Uh, possibly the most important thing I learned that math is actually applicable in real life. And as a math teacher, I go, yes, that's exactly my plan. Um, <laughs> kind of nice. Was that the last one? Yes, it was. So something new to this year that we haven't done before, but part of the National Park Service grant, there's that, you know, you can have the money if. <laughs> um, we have to do a service learning component to it. So that's new for us this year, and that's been a new structure. Um, so we're actually headed to Salem Maritime this Friday, when there will be a high of 42 degrees. <laughs> we will be outside. We saw that. I'm really excited. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we'll be headed to Salem to try to not translate all of the stuff that we've done at the boat shop, but a couple different ideas, and bring it to Salem. Um, and one thing that we've done this year at Lowell's is they have a seventh grade group the seventh grade classes at Amesbury Middle School go to the boat shop and they get the whole history song and dance. But why not bring some math in there? Or just a way to make the place interactive more than, you know, I don't know, more than it is. And it is. That came out wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and this is on camera. Um, but no, just a different way to incorporate another discipline, um, different things that the seventh graders could do. So what my high school students have done is create a mathematical scavenger hunt around the shop. Um, and I'm going to make one of you guys talk about this instead of me. You can. You can. All right. Well, I don't think any of us really. I feel like this is actually the hardest part for us with all the boat shop stuff is we basically what we did is we found different shapes. We had a notebook. In the notebook, we had a list of different shapes that we could use and that the seventh graders would may or may not know. And what we did was we essentially just went around to various parts of the boat shop and tried to see what objects were those shapes. And then we kind of made clues and whatnot so that the seventh graders could actually do something that wasn't just facts and figures about the boat shop. They could actually do something math related. Thank you. That's good. Um, what was fun for me to see in the reflections that kids were giving me was that once they start thinking about it, and this is the math teacher back in me again, math is everywhere. And, you, know, different, you know, different shapes, different sorts of lines, different types of angles. As soon as they're aware of it, they start seeing it, that, oh, there are supplementary angles over here. Oh, there's parallel lines. Oh, that's some sort of crazy prism that I forget what it's called. But they're actually seeing it. And it was just a different lens to look through and to give back to the seventh graders. You know, I... My goal for them was, if you think that this is boring, so will they. So, you know, what can you do? Can you make the clues, you know, go in this direction? Or, or can you make them rhyme? Or is it in pirate talk? Yar. Something to make it, you know, grab them. So that is what we're hoping to extend into Salem when we go on Friday. That's my part of the spiel so far. Yes. I just uh, was wondering the depth of the, the water. That's, that's yep. brilliant. That's really, really, really cool. And thank you guys for coming yeah. and presenting <coughs> to us, really. Thank you. Um, Henry Davis Auro measured the depth of Walden Pond. Do you use that story? I've not used that story. It, it, there's, a, there's a schematic of the pond that he measured sometime between 1845 and 1847 when he lived there at Walden Pond, mm -hmm. and he measured it through the ice by augering, you know, holes through the ice and dropping a weight down to the, you know, but he was also a surveyor, and so he surveyed the transects to get really accurate measurements of the pond, and you can easily find online his schematic that he drew of the depth of the pond, and then, of course, the Army Corps of Engineers came in <laughs> the 1980s or something and said, Ooh, Henry was right, so... <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? You know, and, and of course they had all that's a wonderful connection, yeah. That's, that's a great connection. Thank you, I will, I will write that down. Somebody did, you know, so it's not just us. 
yeah. 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 No, that's a good thing. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, another couple things I wanted to share with you as well, and we alluded to them. I'm going to use Kaylee's because it's on top. So these are provided by the grant as well. Uh, my goal was that all of these things happen at no cost to my students. So even notebooks are there for them. Very cool stuff. And I have a few. I'll kind of give one to each table. But this has, each time we go, I assign reflection questions, which is a math teacher is really hard. Because <laughs> I have to read all these. And, you know, it's not just right or wrong anymore. I have to be subjective. And I, well, anyway, so, but there are these, and they have some really interesting responses. But it also has, um, here are the shapes that we were talking about. It becomes almost a scrapbook of things, but it has the math that relates. So the diagrams of the different problems, or the preview of what we're going to do. And just basically anything that's happened in connection to this program all goes in here. So that's been pretty cool, and I will bring some of those around. Also, if anybody zoned out while I was talking, here's another visual representation for you. This was not paid for by the grant. But um, I realized I had all these different photos because, as you can see, I have many of all the kids working and rowing and stuff. And I wanted a way to acknowledge and thank the boat shop and Effie and to showcase my kids and what they've done. So um, I have a couple of copies of these, and this is just one of those online publishing things, like a snap fish, but cooler, um, that goes through different stuff that we have done. So definitely much more of a showcase than a how-to, but you can take a glimpse at those as well. Um, so as last time I did this, it was a room full of teachers. And they had all sorts of teachery questions. Um, but what questions do you have? What do you want to know? Yes, Marian. I just wondered if uh, maybe Graham could speak to what you see as a benefit to doing something like this, because it all, you know, I think we see the benefit to your students, your passion and excitement in doing this. I bet Graham can speak. To and, yeah, I can um, talk. With the community <laughs> I'm not um, good at sharing. <laughs> uh, well, I think we all learned in high school when you're doing a, a collaborative project, it's best to find a smart kid to do all the work and uh, <laughs> and ride on the coattails. But um, no, I so I'll start. We developed this out of um, my I have a, a tall ship background, which involves sextants and things, which is a pretty archaic tool, but um, for math, it's fantastic. Um, and we at, at Lowell's, we didn't talk about Lowell's because we were running along earlier, but. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lowell's Boat Shop in Amesbury is America's <laughs> oldest boat shop, still operating. Um, the foundation that owns the shop transitioned about seven years ago, and so we've been really trying to ramp up our educational offerings. Um, and luckily, we have a, an enthusiastic teacher. So um, <laughs> we, we came up with this uh, somewhat together. It was more of a, hey, what can we do with this resource um, that's math related? So. Um, for us, it, it's fantastic. It gets us involved in the schools. Um, it's a very successful program. Uh, it has shown success with the students, um, not only in their person, but also um, it's shown a grade point average increase from before the program to after the program. Um, and for us, it's activity at the shop, um, you know, programs that do show results and and are um, replicable, and I'll talk about that in a minute, are, uh, are a benefit to us. And it's, it's within our, our mission getting youth out in boats. Um, and besides all the math and um, the, the personal gains, they, they do get to learn some about their local heritage in the boat shop, not necessarily from me chinwagging about it, but more going out in a dory and, uh, and seeing the shop and seeing the river. Again, the, someone mentioned the river that's in their own backyard that they don't necessarily know much about. Um, when you go out there on a, on a windy day with lots of current after a huge rainstorm, you start to, to get more of a, an appreciation for the river that's in your, in your backyard. Um, but I said replicable. So we've got a, a grant application out now. Not everybody has a boat shop with six stories down the street from their school and can come down for a class period and do this. So, um, 
what most schools do have is a baseball field or a football field with a backstop or uprights and you can use sextants um, to do the same trig on a baseball field and behind the school or uh, map out the school or the, the baseball field or what have you. So um, farmlands. farmlands, you know, whatever. So long as you have, um, we could talk about how this actually works. Um, for those of you who aren't mathletes, um, <laughs> you want to draw a little triangle? Sure. Um, let me shut this thing off. <laughs> here, go to your last slide. Oh, yeah, shut that thing. There you go. There you go. Another use for a sextant. Grab some sextants, students. Um, so what a sextant does, anyone know? Anyone ever use a sextant in here? Uh, how much time do we have? Ten minutes? Marianne, Beth, ten minutes. Okay, yeah, we'll give we'll give one to each table. Uh, so historically, a sextant um, was used for measuring the height of a celestial body for navigation purposes. Basically, taking the angle from uh, the horizon to a star to figure out, you know, where on Earth you were. Um, it can also be used coastwise in taking the height of a bridge or the height of a lighthouse um, and from that you can figure out your distance from it if you know the height of said bridge or lighthouse using some basic trigs. So, yeah, so we... Uh, <laughs> Calvin, Laurel, help these folks out. Um, So you, you've got a little, uh, you've got a little eyepiece here, which I'm sure you can all figure out what that is. Um, so these are used oftentimes to, uh, yeah, hold it in your right hand with the round part down. Um, these are often used to take an angle measure to the sun, and so these guys here are filters so you don't burn your retina out. You don't need them inside, so those will flip up out of the way. Same with these little guys by the eyepiece. So that now you should have, um, you should be able to see something, yeah. not just darkness. <laughs> um, and it might take longer than 10 minutes to, uh, to get you all proficient at it, but um, the basic gist is, as this arm moves, you can, um, in one mirror, or in one, let's see, in the right-hand side mirror, you can see something in the air. Um, that's not even correct either. Um, <laughs> we'll start, I'll tell you what, let's all start this way. If you match up your zeros on the bottom, so slide the arm until zero is at zero. Zero on the bottom is at zero on the top. Wowzers. Foghorn. <laughs> Everyone got that? So when zero is matched up with zero, if there's no error in the instrument, and these are plastic sextants, so chances are very good there's error in them. If you look through the eyepiece, you should be able to see the real world as it is. Um, so there's a little mirror in the front over here. If you look to the left of that mirror, you, you can see the real world, and if you look in the mirror when it's at zero, there should be no change. But if you move the arm, you'll see what happens in the mirror. Whatever's in the mirror starts to move down as you move the arm away from you. You guys get that? Yep. So, at the risk of getting too involved, Amanda can help you do this too. She knows how to do it. Um, what you can do is, if you look at our boat shop, which we know is how, how high? 35 feet. 35 feet. So if you look at our, our boat shop, you can, uh, with this, match up the roof of the shop in one view to the bottom of the shop in the left-hand real, real world view. And wherever that happens will give you a, a height. So let's just say, for instance, I got a height of... 17 degrees. 
from that, I can figure out how far away from that boat shop I am using, using what? Right, right down there. Um, if you move it away from you, what's in the mirror should come down. So, let's take guesses before we figure it out. I know this is freaking you out, and you're probably going to start chasing. <laughs> regular day when we're there the kids will zero it's called zeroing out and as he said we don't really have enough time in 10 minutes to have you at sex and proficiency insert your own joke there um, <laughs> but from various points along the river and across this is something where I can tell you and I can tell the kids that the closer you are to something the larger the angle of elevation will be that's this one but what's great for me is when, you know, they'll take a measurement way across and get like one degree, and then they'll take one in the middle and get like three or four, and then take another one, and then they get two, and they go, wait a minute, I must have done something wrong, because they're actually realizing as you get closer, the angle gets larger. So that's really what we're going for. So, 17 degrees. Any guesses? <laughs> it's okay to be wrong. You don't have your calculator. We're just guessing We're what, just guessing. if I'm, if I've got a height of 17 degrees, how far from the shop I am, if it's 35 feet tall. My guess is I'm about 60 feet from the shop. Yeah, that's what I think too. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? 114 feet away. Oh, no. we were wrong. I'm half wrong. <laughs> Most of the angles, so when we're across the river, we're 1,200 feet away, yeah. thereabouts. Most of the angles are very 2 degrees, and 1 and a half degrees. So it's, um, it's very small, but these are actually incredibly accurate um, tools. So uh, we were able to, uh, again, figure out our distance from a, a bridge, the 95 bridge when you all go to Maine, you go across the Merrimack River. Um, so when we were across the river from the shop, we also took an angle of the bridge and went back to class and figured it out. And then on a nautical chart, we were within 100 feet, I think, of, of um, our distance from that bridge. So uh, that's the, the real world practical application of this if you're on a boat, but there's a lot of math involved. Depending on who is in the boat, that's again, I think the whole trust is going to be out there if you thought of you were going to be like leaning over the edge of the boat or like standing and doing pirouettes or some kind of dance on the seats or something. I think as long as they um, follow the safety protocol, which they provide plenty of, they, they let us know what's okay and what's safe. And as long as you're following that, the current only an issue, I think, with rowing and how well that goes. So yeah, what, it, what I, is the current on a falling tide? Well, what did you guys get? Yeah. We got <laughs> one point something yeah, last night. Oh, so it's, so it's it not seems like the faster than it is. river and it's a mouth of the mouth. I, I, think, I think at its max, it probably gets up to, to two, maybe two and a half. Oh. Um, but, and that's a lot. Um, but we have a motorboat out there, chase boat out around all the kids. Um, they're always wearing life jackets, and we don't do it when the water is cold enough to really hurt anybody. But we're also, you know, the river's 1,200 feet across, so we're never very far from, from land. To and we have insurance, so <laughs> <no worries. laughs> It's not inexpensive, the insurance. We've had days that certainly, I think, seem <clears throat> scarier for the kids than it actually is in real life because, you know, the current, while it's 
it seems really strong, but it's because we are in a pretty small area that we are covering. Um, so they feel like we're going to get swept out to sea. But these are also some of the kids who say, oh, we're going to escape. We're just going to row away. Uh, no. <laughs> The motorboat goes faster than that. Um, but it is something that we talk about in terms of safety and the current, not as much in safety issue, but has messed us up in terms of time. We have returned late to school twice in all of the many visits that we did this. Um, and both of those were due to the current. Um, one of them, it was about half an hour late because we got stuck and didn't get saved by the motorboat soon enough. We were stuck in the current. Um, but it's something that, while initially seems scary, as I said, I had the kids reflect, and a lot of them who, they, they described that as their favorite day because it's such an adventure in retrospect, and they were looking back on it. So, uh, yes, we were mindful of the current, and also the past year especially, we, we were more mindful in planning out which things would happen on what days. So that we were planning our bob in a boat on a good day. That mm -hmm. the depth of the river was on, you know, pretty slack tide, so they weren't trying to drift as they were measuring. So that's something that we have taken in stride a little bit better. Yeah, and we do we do plan ahead, you know, looking at the tide charts for, for good days. Um, but we found with one group this year, they had cakewalk days the first three or four trips um, and a little adversity actually was was good for them at the beginning because um, they gained better proficiency in rowing um, but they also you know learned to to get beyond it and that they could overcome it so do you figure that out what the tides are going to be coming and going that could be another thing that the students could do if you had the time you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's a great education in itself. I mean, that includes navigation and everything, you know? Well, the tides are something that they find, especially on the first couple trips, several students will say, oh, is it always like this at this time of day? And they don't realize how the tides do change and how if you come here at the same time tomorrow, it's not going to be exactly the same and how it does shift and change. And so even when we'll be out there, just the hour that we're on the water, the level of the water, how it changes. You know, we'll be walking down onto the dock and it's a really steep angle, we'll come back and it's not quite as bad, and they're like, oh. And that's just a concept that, you know, they live, this river goes through town. But they n they've never paid attention, they've never thought to look at it that way. Thanks. So I'll it. Hey, Jess, do you have administrative support for this? My administrators think this is great. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I do have administrative oh. support. Yes. Any of your, is it just with one class? This is with um, <laughs> two classes. I think in the spring it will be with three. That's just kind of the way the hand is dealt. But it's with honors juniors, so a pre-calculus course, and um, college prep juniors, seniors mix. So it's that trigonometry class, but it, since we have done this, I think we've brought over 200 kids down in the nine or 11 different classes that have been part of it. And are your colleagues jealous? They are. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Especially the days that, you know, it's a beautiful sunny day in May, and I come to school in shorts and say, we're going rowing. <laughs> Not there been... Jess has done a lot of work and has jumped through many hoops to make it Many happen. hoops. I'm a great yeah. hoop jumper. And you're bold to take them out and to do it. It's such a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a risk. It's That's, as an educator, one of the hardest parts to just kind of let go. And, you know, as you said, we're there and the safety isn't really an issue. But to that first little launch, and there they go. It's like Mama Duck going, oh, my gosh, where, where are they going? Uh, yeah. But also, personally, I feel it's a really great thing because they, they're learning through adversity. You know, very few of them are natural rowers or have rowed ever before. And it takes a while to fig figure things out. And as they realize the, the different journal entries, and I have to say that it's not just them saying what they think I want to hear, but the genuine reflections of, 
you know, you can't just row for yourself, you have to work as a team, or the boat's not going to go anywhere. And I can tell them that, but for them to figure that out and to see it, that's amazing. Um, great. Uh, so uh, I introduced myself very briefly before. Um, I'm Mary Kay Taylor. I'm the Education Director here at Maritime Gloucester. Um, and Scott and I are going to be presenting on uh, what for Maritime Gloucester is one of our core programs. Um, it's uh, called our Ocean Explorers Program. Um, Scott from Manchester Essex uh, Regional School District uh, just uh, joined in the program last year. Um, it's a program that we had piloted um, over the past, uh, well not piloted, but we piloted it early on <laughs> um, and over the past eight years have grown uh, the program through the Gloucester Public Schools uh, working with grades three through five um, throughout that district. Um, last year we had an opportunity, a funding opportunity that came our way um, and we were able to actually to expand uh, that program to all of the school districts uh, regionally on Cape Ann. Um, and so that's when Scott um, and I started talking about um, how that expansion would look, how it would work, um, you know, courting the district, trying to get that elusive administrator buy-in. <laughs> um, and uh, so what we were kind of presenting on today is some of the lessons that we learned uh, through that process. Um, so uh, this is a really text-heavy slide. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, this is just kind of how our program is structured. Um, so our Ocean Explorers is an elementary science enrichment program. Uh, we work with third, fourth, and fifth grade students um, in all the Cape Ann Public Schools, so it's about 1,500 kids. Um, uh, we have about uh, 1,500 kids in the program um, across all of the districts. Um, in uh, Manchester, Essex, uh, that would be 19 elementary classrooms with about 360 students um, in that district alone. Um, each year uh, we participate in two half-day visits to Maritime Gloucester um, and four in-class visits throughout the school year. So um, one of our favorite things about this program um, is that it's multi-part. Um, it is uh, allowing kids to not only have this really cool experience like you talked about the first time they go out rowing in a dory, right, and that excitement of a one-shot field trip, um, but they're actually able to build on that first sight experience uh, throughout the year through the um, in-school presentations um, and then culminate um, at the end of the year with another visit here on site. Um, it's a three-year program, so it's sequential, and so we have uh, these kids uh, 18 visits over three years. Um, so we're kind of old and boring, um, <laughs> and the content is more exciting than the experience um, we find uh, during later parts of uh, the program as well, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so uh, we have uh, all of our learning units um, are integrated into the school curriculum. So um, I've heard a lot of that today, uh, that we don't have a set kind of field trip menu that you pick from. Um, we have found when we start to go to schools, the best way to approach a school is say, what do you need? These are our resources. Um, this is what we have to offer. How can we fit with what you're doing to support your classroom, um, your classroom curriculum? Um, not just how can we add a fun and exciting experience right on top of what you're doing. Um, so that's one of the things that Scott will talk to. Um, he's been really, really integral in coordinating all of the program and the curriculum units uh, to integrate pretty well into their um, established curriculum already. Um, another thing that the program supports is uh, pre yearly professional development for teachers. Um, so all of the teachers involved in the program um, are participating um, in a three-hour professional development workshop that uh, relates directly to the program um, learning that the students are doing. Uh, we were really fortunate. Uh, we have our partner, the boat, uh, the schooner Ardell, uh, so we had all the teachers out. Um, one of the things I will say about Manchester Essex is we have really struggled trying to get teachers to do professional development and come and show up in great numbers. Every single teacher <laughs> and administrator and a couple um, other associated teachers um, came to the first kickoff professional development. So we actually had 23 uh, teachers, um, administrators, and support staff who were there. So I mean, it was a pretty amazing turnout. Um, and I credit Scott a lot with that. Um, so uh, another part, uh, this kind of goes to uh, what Rashawn was saying earlier, all of the materials um, that we present are supported through um, developed curriculum units that are presented in pre-post um, visit materials for the teachers. So there are student, uh, student materials and also teacher background um, so that uh, especially the teachers who are new to the subject area will have some background um, to answer student questions, um, also some resources that they can be pointed to to develop uh, their 
their own background uh, in these subject matters. Um, and then another really great thing is uh, this is part of a three-year BWET grant right now. Um, prior to that, we had received funding from NOAA, uh, Northeast Regional Office, now Greater Atlantic Fisheries Office, um, and we actually have NOAA staff that are participating um, on all of the trips that we do aboard the Ardell. So these students are not only getting exposed to um, <coughs> our method of teaching, our learning, but they're also actually working with real scientists in the field um, who are incorporating this type of science into their career um, and their everyday life. Um, so, uh, we're going to start off with um, establishing the partnership, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Scott for a little bit. There you go. If I can get this to let go. Come on. There we go. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. As uh, Mary Kay had said, my name is Scott Morrison, and I'm the director of uh, curriculum and technology for the Manchester Essex Regional Schools. So uh, Tom and Mary Kay had asked me to talk a little bit about how to st how to establish that partnership. I think oftentimes it's it's tough for um, different community organizations to get involved in the schools because the schools there's so much going on and uh, there are so many things already in place that to try to like crack into that with a with a pry bar sometimes can be very very difficult. And the best advice I can give is that um, there's a concept in the business world called the golden circle. And uh, Simon Sinek has a great TED Talk, if you've never seen it, um, on YouTube. It's an excellent TED Talk. And he talks about the golden circle. And basically the golden circle, what it sort of emphasizes is that if you think of sort of like a, a dartboard or a bullseye or whatever the case may be, on the outside of that bullseye is the, is the what, and the inner ring is the how, and then the bullseye is the why. And too often um, we tell each other what we do and we tell each other how we do it and we never get to the why we do it. And the why is actually very, very important. The why is probably the most important thing. And we spend so much time on the what and the how that by the time the phone calls kind of like run its course, you never get to the why. And the why is where the deeper meaning is. You know, you talk about deeper meaning, I think, when you were making your point. The deeper meaning is with the why. And so when Mary Kay and I had that conversation, she kind of did that naturally. Um, when we had that conversation, yes, it was a little bit on the what we do and a little bit on how we do it. But the bigger mission was the why, and that's what attracted me to develop this partnership because the why is very, very important. We'll talk a little bit more about the why uh, as we get into a few more slides. But, you know, he, he gives great examples in this TED Talk um, about why some companies make it and other companies don't. And he gives a great example of, like, TiVo. I don't know if you remember TiVo, but TiVo was that company that you could record live TV. And the reason they were kind of a commercial failure is because they told you what they did and how they did it. They didn't tell you why. And then he goes on to compare how like Apple, Apple tells you the why. Apple doesn't say, hey, we make really great computers. Apple says, hey, if you want to control every aspect of your life and integrate your music with your lifestyle and all these other things, then buy our products. And it's a much better sales pitch, so to speak. So when you reach out to schools, my advice to you would be to get quickly to the why. If you're looking to develop a community partnership, if you're looking to develop a, a regional partnership or whatever the case may be, the sooner you can get to the why, um, you'll have a, a stronger hook uh, and a connection with the school district. How can you seamlessly integrate? And Mary Kay touched upon this. This is very, very important. I think of school as a train that pulls out of the train station on late August, early September, and it's 180 miles, right? It's going, and it doesn't slow down. So the way you can kind of do repairs to it is if you hang out the window and, and fix things and so on and so forth. That's sort of the visual I have of the school year. And it just goes and goes and goes. And if you want to bring people on board, they have to be able to run 180 miles an hour so they can kind of keep up with the train so you can actually pull them on to what it is you're trying to do. And so you have to figure out how can you seamlessly integrate. And, and the way this works is sort of you have to come out of the gate strong, so to speak. If it's a new initiative, it's some, if it's something new at a school, you don't want to have any sort of initial stumbles out of the gate because those initial stumbles, oh, I, I knew this program wasn't going to work. Some of your initial doubters will be, oh, I knew it wouldn't work. No, this isn't going to be for us. And then you get some of that negative chatter, and that negative chatter overtakes uh, the, the great product that might be available to you. And so I think making sure that your program can align seamlessly with what's trying to happen in the schools, but then also really coming out of the gate in a way that um, there's an initial early success. And so we had that initial early success with the PD. I think of that PD day for the teachers. And yes, it was, you know, we'll talk about this in a later slide, but being able to go out on the boat and have the professional development and see the level of organization that exists here at Maritime Gloucester and, and the support structures that are in place and, um, 
the real um, care that people take here in the work that they do. I think that was, uh, I think, very evident to the, to the folks at Manchester Essex. And when you see that care, you say that that's an organization that we certainly want to be involved with. So engaging the teachers. So yeah, boat rides are nice. Like that was the easiest PD sell ever. I could say, hey, we're going to do some professional development. We're going to take a nice cruise around Gloucester Harbor. And oh yeah, guess what? There's a little bit of a stipend for you as well. So like, you know, I can't take much credit for that because it was like a boat and a couple of bucks. Hey, you know, we'll go, we'll go have professional development on a boat. And that was great. It would have failed very quickly, though, if there was no meaning. That's what's most important to teachers. The boat ride is nice, and the stipend was very, very, was very nice as well that they were able to write that into the grant for folks to come after hours and do the professional development on the boat. It's got to have meaning. At the end of the day, this is what will be long-lasting. These two things are awesome, and they're, they're great in, ways, ways to incentivize things. But if the meaning isn't there, if the teachers don't see the immediate value of how it connects to their classroom and the work that they're trying to do, because I think, as we all know, you think of the school year, like everything has changed in education, curriculum, instruction, assessment, the kids, the teachers, what we know about learning and thinking and cognition and all of these things. What hasn't learned is the amount of time we have in the day. We still have 180 and six and a half, right? And even that's not really true. Because if you take out the half days and performances and all these other things, it's really not 180. And if you take out lunch and all these other things and transitions, it's really not six and a half hours. So we're trying to do a lot in a little bit of time. And so the more that you can attach meaning to the work and show teachers how this will help them, you've got a better chance at longevity. So working together, I think the three things when I was looking at this slide and, and Mary Kay and I were kind of going back and forth over email, working together, it really takes a, a good amount of communication. You have to stay connected to um, the folks that you're working with. I think that's very, very important. You have to be invested in that relationship. And, and Mary Kay and Amanda and Tom would, would Amanda. absolutely, would hugely communicate. I mean, in terms of uh, field trip scheduling and coordination, Amanda kind of like let up that whole part. And it was a huge help to me because the email back from Amanda was, Scott, I got it. I'll just give me the teacher's email addresses and I'll take care of it. And that's like, you know, that's just heavenly, right? When you hear something like that, it's like one less thing. And so having that level of communication is so important. Having that level of organization is so important. Again, if you think of that 180 miles train, if the people who are trying to you know, get on that train aren't running, aren't organized, they're not going to be able to, they can run 180 miles an hour, but if they don't have all this stuff together, they're going to get on and it's just going to be kind of a mess. And you're going to be like, ah, I'm sorry, I don't have time right now for this. And so being organized and prepared for when you come into the school, and I think you know, they had the great benefit here of working in other districts as well. I think uh, Gloucester was already on board, was Rockport on board? They started with us as well. We were chasing 200. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then expectations, right? I mean, I think we, I was very clear about what the expectations were of our school district. The folks here at Maritime Gloucester were very clear about what their expectations were. And I think it's like any relationship in life, right? Whether it's uh, your friend, your significant other, or your parents, or whatever the case may be, it's always about communication. Always about communication. And if there is an issue or a concern, you figure it out and you work it out and you have those conversations and what's great for us is it's right up the road it's a 10 minute 15 minute ride uh, right up the street here for us to come here or for uh, Mary Kay and her folks to to come down to our neck of the woods as well and I think to that one of our first initial meetings when we started the dance so to speak of, of this is something that we'd like to pursue I pulled a teacher leadership group together and uh, Amanda and Mary Kay I think came down and met with that teacher leadership group and and so having that early buy-in as well was very, very important. So have the teachers excited about it. So I was excited about it, but it wasn't me then going to the teachers and saying, hey, let me sell this thing to you. They were involved from the very beginning. So what was nice about our partnership as well is uh, another world that I've been involved in is the STEM world, right? I, my, my latest sort of mission in life is to uh, convince people that, you know, we need to start early with science, right? We just need to start early with technology and engineering. I think all too often um, we wait until sixth grade to really expose kids to any sort of organized science and you know, shame on us in public ed if that's the case. We really do need to start young with these uh, ideas. And so what was great about our partnership was uh, Amanda and I think Mary Kay may have attended a couple sessions as well. We had put together a program called STEM Squared. It was strengthening the teaching of elementary minds in science, technology, engineering, and math. But because of that partnership with the folks here, Folks here were attending some of those sessions. We had 
teachers coming here. So it really was this dynamic partnership that emerged and it has everybody sort of talking about uh, the same thing. And what it is that we're talking about is Benjamin Bloom, really, at the end of the day. I don't know how many of you, how many have heard of Benjamin Bloom somewhere along the line? Yeah. So he had it right in the 50s. This is going back a ways, right? He developed a taxonomy of learning back in the 1950s. It, believe it or not, it's called Bloom's Taxonomy. How, how original, right? And Bloom's Taxonomy is made up of lower order thinking and higher order thinking. And lower order thinking is kind of what you would expect it to be, remembering, understanding, and applying. And higher order thinking is creating and evaluating and analyzing. And this is the world that we need to live in. We need to live in this higher order world. We need our kids to live in this higher order world of creating, evaluating, and analyzing. The, the folks that presented prior to this, they have their kids living in that world, right? They're not just remembering things and understanding things. And you have to do these things in order to get to the higher order thinking skills, but they are creating and evaluating and analyzing and synthesizing. Those are the higher order skills needed of today. And this is where you get into that concept of the why again, the why of education, right? And when I think about the why of education, I think about the practices of education. And if you're familiar with the common core standards for English language arts, if you're familiar with the common core standards for mathematics, if you're familiar with uh, the next generation science standards with Massachusetts is working on adopting uh, new science frameworks that will certainly incorporate some of the ideas from the next generation science standards. If you're familiar with those documents, a thread that is woven through all of those documents is this idea of practices, engaging in practices. And I really think personally, we need to begin to make that part of our vernacular in education. I think that people practice law and people practice medicine. We need to also practice education because practice connects a skill to content. That's what a practice does. A lawyer, when he's practicing law, is connecting the skills that he's learned or she's learned with the content that he or she has learned. It's the same thing in education. We need to begin to think about practicing education. And when you get into the practices of education, that's when you get to the why of what you're doing, right? To me, the practices are the rebar and concrete, so to speak. The practices of education, if we can lay these things down and then pour the content over it, boy, will that content be really solidified. And these practices of education are strongly related to these higher order thinking skills, are getting kids to think about core competencies, getting kids to think about higher order thinking, getting kids to think in a manner that they are analyzing and evaluating and, and making an argument from evidence. You see that oftentimes in social studies uh, curriculum, in a science curriculum, making an argument from evidence. When you do that, you're engaging in this higher order thinking. And so all of these things were existing within our partnership, which makes it very, very attractive to us in the sense of uh, we have our kids engaging in higher order thinking and, and critically examining information and taking information apart and exploring it. And then getting into the why. I think, again, if you think about programs trying to convince a school that you want to be part of us, I think teachers <laughs> need to move past the what and the how as well. I think oftentimes, let's take the American Revolution, for example. We talk about what the American Revolution is. We talk about how it happened. But do we talk about why it happened? That's where deeper meaning occurs. And so you can apply that concept to any content area that you currently do. So whatever your program is, think about the what and the how, but also think about the why, and then think about how you can bring that why to the uh, organizations that you're trying to work with. Does that make sense? OK. Questions? Do you have some things before questions? That'll help us catch up. Yeah. That sound okay? All right. Uh, uh, no one ever said, I really wish that speaker would talk longer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll just, I'll just mention this slide. This is one of my favorite slides uh, that we have in the presentation. Um, and uh, I don't know if, Scott, if you can see, um, these aren't actually Manchester no, Essex yeah, students, yeah, yeah. but the guy teaching them is. So um, one of the really fun things about the program was we also had um, interns that assisted in some of the education. And so that's Jack Freed, who was oh. one of your high school seniors doing your SCORE program. That's great. As our, um, so that's why I threw him on yeah. stuff. <laughs> They're right. looking at an underwater camera, if anybody is <laughs> wondering what the image is.